Hi, my name is Mark Ward and I'm the festival programmer for the Redline Book Festival brought to you by Set Double Libraries. We're delighted to be celebrating our 10th anniversary festival with 84 events happening in person, online or both. Please check out redlinebookfestival.ie for the full program and the festival runs until Sunday the 17th of October. We're absolutely thrilled to welcome Tari Peters, author of Detransition Baby, who will be in conversation with Sean Fay, author of The Transgender Issue and Argument for Justice, for a fascinating conversation about their work. We still have a whole host of other events throughout the week. On Saturday, the 16th of October, we have authors Keith Ridgway and Nell Burke chatting about their novels A Shock and Line with the 2021 Rooney Prize winner, Neve Campbell. Online, we also have Hashtag Obsessed, featuring Megan Nolan, author of Acts of Desperation, and Eliza Clark, author of Boy Parts, who will be in discussion with Kirch Festival director, Sasha DePaul. But first, we're delighted to welcome you to Detransition Baby, Tari Peters, in conversation with Sean Fay. Hi, everyone. Um, I am here with Tori Peters, who is the author of Detransition Baby, uh, a novel published uh, this year in the UK and Ireland, I believe, um, and which has taken the world by storm. It was the first novel by a trans author to be published by a big five publishing house and went on to be longlisted for the Women's Prize and honoured as a New York Times editor's choice. Tori Peters lives in Brooklyn and holds an MFA from the University of Iowa and a Master's in Comparative Literature from Dartmouth. She is the author of two novellas, Infected Friends and Loved Ones and The Master. Um, and I actually interviewed Tori when the book had just been published on this side of the Atlantic in the bitter, cold uh, lockdown at the start of the year. Uh, and so it's really great to join you back and to, to be in conversation with you, Tori, now that the book has been in the world and uh, percolating through the culture in the way it has for several months. I guess as an opening question, um, yeah, I'm wondering what, if anything, uh, if there's anything that sort of changed significantly for you about in, in the last few months with the success you've had and how you feel generally about how the book has been received. Well, uh, before we talk about what's changed for me since that last interview and this interview, I think it's also worth noting what's changed for you. Just uh, it, <laughs> because, uh, for I mean, most people I'm sure watching this know who Sean is, but... Uh, if I was the second uh, uh, trans woman to be on the Times bestseller list, Sean is the third, and that happened not that happened between when my book came out and now. Like so, uh, you've had equally like a, a crazy year I have. So I just kind of want to uh, just acknowledge that before I, I start being like, oh, it's been so wild for me because you're like, yeah. yeah. Now. Was that too? <laughs> um, but, um, I wouldn't be so harshly, but I get where you're coming from. But yeah, carry on. Yeah. Um, so I mean, and so you, I imagine you're, you know, still kind of in the whirlwind of yourself. But I, it was it was interesting for me um, in that I think most people talk about you know a book comes out in the and um, you have like sort of six weeks in which the book's reputation is made or not. It's like with publishing industry, people say for most books. But it's kind of funny and weird to be a, you know, a trans woman writing these books because you get all of these other tales to the publishing cycle that don't happen, uh, I think, for many other authors. In my case, um, you know, there's sort of, the book came out through the six weeks of publicity that every you know publishing company does, and then came the women's award, and then which was a controversy because I was the first trans woman nominated for the women's award, and then came things like Pride Month, and then came uh, sort of like this weird summer of COVID and, and a lot of like cultural issues. Uh, some of which uh, intersect with your book too. So that what has ended up happening is that these, I keep on expecting it to be like, all right, the book is out and, uh, you know, on to the next thing. But it kind of keeps coming back because of the place of trans women in publishing and then no one's exactly sure. Or we're, we're, we're kind of forging what that means in this era. Does that match with your experience? Uh <laughs> 
it does a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I obviously, yeah, I have the, uh, it's like mirror image of that in which like, um, because yours was fair, uh, I guess <laughs> it didn't help my anxiety necessarily because you were sort of like a prefiguration <laughs> of, of what might have happened. <laughs> around the women's side um and we can go into more detail about that in a second about obviously yeah because you're based in the us and you published in the uk and the women's prize for anyone that's watching and obviously it's a primarily irish audience but the women's prize obviously being based in the uk and i think irish people will be familiar with the, the, the climate in the uk and the very fact that a trans woman was nominated for something with women in the title is enough to generate a controversy but yeah having seen that i guess i was a little bit wary but i think yeah, at the same time, I've been quite, I feel quite lucky that, um, there has been a kind of wave of publishing, uh, by trans people and trans women, uh, certainly on this side of the Atlantic. So, you know, you, but also like Paris Lee's memoir and, um, uh, there, yeah, there are a couple of trans novels, British trans novels coming out. Um, and, uh, yeah, Juliet Jakes published a book of short stories and, uh, Ros Cabany has just published a book as well in the UK. And so there just seems to be a bit of a flourish. And I'm quite pleased in a way, um, that my book kind of exists in this moment where people are having this conversation more generally and I'm not the only one, <laughs> yeah. which I, expect, I expected to be before I, um, you know, because when I, you know, how on books tape, I expected to be the only one because there was no one else around. And I'm quite pleased that 2021, it seems to have been a year that like, Everyone got the idea to maybe do something like 2018, 2019, and then all yes. the fruit is like is being yielded now. Um, yeah, and yeah, I guess I guess one thing that yeah interests me is that I think um, one thing that's interesting is that obviously yeah, my book is is a nonfiction book, but I've been approached about a second work. It's amazing how my book has been out a month, and people start um, talking about the next book immediately, and they're like, "I'm still doing a publicity tour." Um, but your book comes up a lot in um, pitch discussions and, and editors mention now your book quite a lot. So in quite a short space of time, you've become kind of like Detransition Baby has become, because of it was successful, has become like the go-to um, yeah. as like the one couple that people have heard of. <laughs> when they're like, you're a trans woman, Sean plays a trans woman and so is Tori Peter. Uh, and yeah, I'm wondering how you feel about that because I know you've been very careful to um, cite your novel within a history of trans literature and not make yourself exceptional in that way. Um, but obviously, that's how a cis publishing industry works. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, you know, I don't. I guess people might write. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it. it's it, it's it's sort of a thing where where you know. It, it sort of speaks to what, what you were saying. I, when I was writing, there was like another, you know, there were novels like Nevada that were, you know, more, they were like the famous books, right? And I was, I was like, that was like the book that I wanted to like do what it did and maybe even surpass it. And so I assume that there are now people out there, you know, looking, especially trans women, like reading Detransition Baby and I want to write something better you know and there that is that's kind of hardening to me like to be in that position like in some ways it's hard because i'm like hey i want to like actually make this a movement i want this to be helpful but i also appreciate it like, because i i remembered what it was like to to have this big book what felt like big books you know um in precedence for me that that i aspired to it's like it's cool doing that but it's also cool in that I think that the best books, um, and not just trans books, like the best books, period, tend to come out of movements, right? Like, it's never lone authors who are like, this is, you know, you think about Paris in the 20s, it's not just Hemingway. It's like Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Joyce and Joseph Possums and Gertrude Stein, right? And it was like the, the, the synergy of all of them ended up like boosting each other and making it, that's why you have a movement. You know, same with like Harlem Renaissance or the Beats, like, and so for me, I want all those other people to compete because it's good for them. Like, the more that there are, the more that this becomes a movement, the more that this becomes has like real energy that that one person couldn't make alone. The more, 
you know, so long as my book isn't completely surpassed and forgotten, um, the better it is for me. So, um, and, and I think that that's, uh, that's like something I'm hoping for. It is, it is interesting the way that that can happen with, with fiction, um, especially in this moment, because I feel like there's, the f- fiction is doing two different things. Like one is we're telling stories and we're, you know, doing what literature has always done. But two, there's like an interesting sort of social thing that, that the fiction is doing right now. And I wonder about how, what kind of role did that social thing will play in 10 years when, you know, honestly, books like yours, I hope, like, obviate the need for that kind of social, I don't know, I don't want to say like education or lessons, but it's like, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people who will read my book and be like, this is so educational. And I also want to be like, yeah, but was it a good story? <laughs> you know yeah. um so uh, i'm you know i'm hoping that for not just other fiction writers i'm hoping for books like yours to succeed wildly yeah i mean i think that's an interesting contrast between me as a non-fiction writer who yeah like my book is trans apologia like 101 really um albeit that i make it distinct by perhaps not trying to like focus on identity um, that was my USP was to like, I was not going to write a book necessarily about gender identity, but more about, um, politics and how we relate to each other in the world. But I think, yeah, for me, I think it's, it's an interesting one because mine is to a certain degree, I'm used to the idea of instruction, but I don't necessarily think, uh, I would hope that, yeah, like I kind of like make my own book obsolete. <laughs> Whereas yeah. I think fiction has a, ch- like fiction, Hopefully, it's more expansive than that. That like that fiction is constantly like elusive and um, trying to push boundaries in that way. Um, and I'm just wondering, yeah, whether or not you think when you say people say that they found it educational, do you actually find that like a positive, or do you feel like they've misunderstood what you were trying to do? Of interest. <laughs> I mean, a little of both, right? It's like, whenever someone likes your book, it's like, I'll take it. You know, like, I'm, like you got to scrap for whatever you can get. And so you're like, I'm not, I'm not, you know, hold my nose at somebody who found it educational. Thank you. Like, thanks for reading my book. Thanks for thinking about it. Thanks for like empathizing and stuff like that. Um, you know, at the same time, it was like, um, it was like in the United States, uh, after George, George Floyd, there were all these sort of like appeals to read books in on anti-racist terms and like Toni Morrison was always like under James Baldwin was always on that list and and like it seems to me like such a narrow reading of Toni Morrison and James Baldwin to basically be like I'm going to read these books just so I can be less racist it's like that that is itself like such a such a constrained lens to bring to such great artistry um, and then, you know, I'm not trying to compare myself. It's like, when I say such great artistry, it sounds like it's like redounding upon me. I'm not trying to say that, but I, but I do think that like, there's a way, there's a way in which, um, you know, the, the, I'm not only trying to do one thing. And, and, um, and so when people approach my book through a really narrow lens, uh, I'm often like, look, it's doing other stuff. And that's actually why I took the kind of approach that I did in terms of like, you know, dedicating this book to, to cis divorced women, um, because I really actually see like the solutions to my problems, not in like solving sort of trans issues, but in solving, uh, in, in like basically conversations between women in, in ways of like, I learned how to be in the world as much from cis women as from trans women. When I was writing this book, I was reading, um, you know, I was reading Rachel Cosco, I was reading Lena Ferrante, I was reading these books by divorced cis women. And the thing I talk about in the book is that the trajectory of a divorced cis woman looks a lot like the trajectory of a trans woman, where you live your life a certain way, and then there's kind of a break, uh, and you have to go forward, having lost perhaps a lot, and without reinvesting in the old illusions that brought you to that break or getting better. And that, that way of being, like the ways forward on that, I learned from, from cis women. And so if you bring a purely educational lens to my book, 
you miss those kind of resonances and you miss the fact that there's an opportunity for a real conversation. Um, and, and that also means that you get to speak, like if it's a conversation, you get to speak back to like a teacher student relationship between a book and a reader is a, is a really one way relationship. It's like, here's how it is now go off and like apply these lessons to the world, you know? And so when I get readers who are like, thank you for teaching me, I'm always like, yeah, well, what do you have to say back? Like, this book mm-hmm. is provocative. This book is is uh, pushing boundaries, and you shouldn't necessarily take those boundaries at, at face value. Like, I'm trying to get a reaction out of the reader. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to like, uh, you know, force a decree about the way the world is onto a reader. And so I think it's a it's just like a kind of mode of reading that that I that I, I'm interested in fiction because I think it can can open up those other. Yeah, do you think actually, you know, on that as an extension of that point, that, that I think it's something that's been circulating around. I don't want to blame Tumblr. Everyone blames everything on Tumblr. But like, you know, <laughs> whether, whether it's Twitter or Tumblr, I mean, I see this regularly from writers that I know, particularly queer and trans ones, about this like break between fiction and nonfiction and considering where two writers that have worked. And yeah, like mine is probably my writing thus far published is seems more didactic. Although similarly, I actually do think. I still want my like my readers to have some critical like I don't just tell them what to do. It's kinda of like here are some problems and here is what needs to happen at a kind of grand systemic way for it to change. But I'm not like I'm now gonna light the way completely on how to do that. It's like have some critical faculties. Um and I'm very used to going on panels where people are like, What can we do as allies? And I understand yeah. that, but it really shocks me sometimes how much people want to be told what to do. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and actually, that's not really engaging with, uh, you know, like my my role in terms of like, uh, like, like if it's anti-racism, like not all black people agree. So like, uh, you know, my job is kind of to read widely and then to maybe form, do some critical thinking about like my own relationship to upholding racism. But like, I think it's that Instagram in- infographic kind of culture. I think that people want that. And where I think it comes into into fiction, which is why we're not asking about it, is a lot of writers I know seem to complain that we have somehow slipped. And I don't know if this has always been a problem. You know, like the cat person short story is that yeah. people seem to really be like bound on finding moral truth. It's very Victorian, like moral truth within fiction. Yeah. Like if characters do something problematic, that means the author is, yeah. is the extension of the author, particularly for women. And I wondered if, if you could talk a little bit about um, yeah, what your feelings are about that. I mean, you had a very extreme reaction to it in that like, people thought that because your character, Reese, says misogynistic things, ergo, you are a misogynist. You know, how yeah. do, you, do you find that frustrating? How do, you, how do you find working as a fiction writer in a kind of climate where people do that, make that I kind mean, of leap? Outside of the text, it's very bracing, right? Like it's bracing to have people insult you on Twitter and say that you're, you know, a horrible person and let you, you know, perpetuate all this stuff, which I don't even think that Reese really says that stuff. I think that's been like a shorthand, like a shorthand misreading of what he says. Um, and I think that Reese actually is, is saying nuanced things from a damaged and partial perspective, but that, you know, so, so there's like how it feels to publish in this climate, which is bad. But then there's also this thing where it's like, what? This is actually a, the fact that everybody's like scared to say stuff or like all this stuff is a huge opportunity. Like, I, I was re I was rereading Portnoy's complaint, um, Philip Roth, and it's like so offensive in in so many different ways, and it's so entertaining, and it's so incisive, and it's working in like all these modes that are outmoded. Uh, what's a uh, funny choice of words, but yeah, these these modes that that we don't work in, and they're so entertaining. And I feel like people are the fact that that we would let people's reaction to a text um, kind of chill how we write texts. If, if other writers want to do that, well, that just provides a great opportunity. And it takes some time to, I think, get away from that sort of chilling reaction. Like during the Women's Prize. And the subsequent stuff I found, and even just like, you know, people on Goodreads or whatever, 
I found my sentence structure changed. My sentence structure got a lot simpler. It got less metaphorical or figurative. Um, it was, I was afraid to offend. And it took me about like four months to sort of get out of that. But I feel like by getting out of it, um, I'm in this place of opportunity, whereas I think so many people get like, hemmed into that sort of thing. And then there's a bunch of books that all look the same. So for me, like, I can look at this kind of thing and be like, oh, this is, this is a, such a weird era. Or I can look at it and say, like, this is an era of, like, incredible opportunity if you're willing to take a risk. Yeah. And I'm interested to know, how did you get out of, out of it? I'm sure there'll be people who are, who are perhaps find themselves in similar blocks who uh, would be intrigued by it. I mean, I'm kind of intrigued by it on a personal. How did you get out of it, Tori? <laughs> I write a lot of books not from this era. Like, I just, like, that's why I'm reading things like Port. Like, and the things that yeah. books that are from out of this era, I think they reflect on this era. Like, you know, Philip Roth is somebody who was writing, you know, in the beginning of his career, he was writing minority literature. It was like Philip Roth and Ralph Ellison on minority panels. You know, Philip Roth is a Jewish American writer. When he died, he was not held up as the Jewish writer. He was held up as like a great American writer. And that he navigated somehow from a position of, of, of uh, he like sort of went through this like wormhole of specificity. Where this is a specific Jewish, not even Jewish experience, the Newark, New Jersey experience. He like went through that wormhole and he ended up writing something that all these books that seemed universal. So I've been like looking at him to see how did he make those moves? And he didn't make those moves by being safe. Like he didn't make those moves by, by, I don't, I mean, he was a smart careerist writer and he did, did certainly read the reviews, but he was, he was unconstrained. So I read these people and I look, take like a longer view. I'm like, okay, yeah, these people are getting yelled at in their time, but they're not responding to their time. They're responding to like a larger historical period. And I just began, began reading and thinking about a longer historical period, which freed me from thinking of my peers as the people who say mean things on Twitter to my peers being like great writers, you know, and, and that's maybe an egotistical or audacious thing to do to put myself in that peer group, but it's a very freeing thing to do. No, thank you. Um, yeah, and on that point, you've alluded to it a couple of times, but, uh, you know, I'm British, you're American, and we're at an Irish book festival. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested to know, yeah, like, <laughs> I'm interested to know, you published The Transition Baby, like, yeah, both in the UK and the US. And obviously, we've, you've mentioned the w Women's Prize, the UK uh, Prize, that caused the controversy. But you also mentioned to me, I think, when we spoke once between our two interviews this year, when we were talking about my book, actually, about you also had a lot, like your book was, um, you know, real commercial success in the UK, even though you had a much more targeted backlash about some, some things, particularly around the women's prize. I'm just, yeah, I'm just interested if I think, and I think Irish people watching this will be interested to know because they, you know, we're their neighbours and they know what's going on in the British culture and how unhinged it can be. Um, and it, it's not really reflected in the same way in my Irish feminism. But I'm just wondering, yeah, what your your experience of the difference in the reception between the US and the UK. Like, you know, it did really well here in the UK, where I'm recording from. Um, but like, yeah, you, you probably had to contend with things that you didn't in the US. I'm, I'm wondering what your overall feeling is about the difference between those two publishing markets as a trans woman. Um, I think this goes back to something that you said to me in, in the first interview. In the first interview, you had said to me, that in some ways with the like sort of climate in the UK of transphobia of like constant sort of debating uh, trans women's womanhood or even humanity in the press, it would have been unimaginable to write something like what I wrote simply because I had so much, um, I had so much sort of like freedom to, sorry, uh, I had so much freedom to just kind of imagine whatever, um, whatever I wanted and my hope is that actually by like publishing the book there that same freedom like I, I feel like there's a bunch of books in the UK that are all now doing this because they're like oh you actually can imagine this 
huge amounts of freedom for yourself. Um, that's one kind of point is I think that, you know, what I did, I think it actually translates and it, it, it travels. Um, but the second thing is that I had a real, real, uh, ro- like a real roller coaster with my relationship to, um, the UK. And, and like, you know, I was just sort of like, I was like, what is wrong with that place? Like, why are those people so unhinged? What's like, what is, <laughs> what is like, why can't they get a grip? Um, because in the United States, the reaction to the book was, was mostly, it was pretty mild. And then, so I spent a couple of months like being like, what's wrong with that culture? And then I, uh, and then I sort of like settled down myself and stopped and sort of, sort of talked by it. And then I was began to be like, oh, this is like really interesting because I think in the United States, it's a big country, but, um, and so like, yeah, it sold a lot of books, but it actually wasn't as heated as in the UK. Like, it's almost like we did, we had our, we had our big controversies over like what influencers say what. Whereas like, I looked at your book when your book came out and it was like, it was being debated in the pages of the times on BBC. And you had sort of like, you had a kind of like conversation about what it meant to be trans that was carried out in the pages of newspapers. I don't see that conversation about what it means to be trans being carried out in like thoughtful places, like places that publish thoughtful things, or if not even thoughtful, like at least the pretense to thoughtfulness. And I'm not going to say that everything, every paper in the UK is thoughtful. But but I will say that like, you know, uh, there are a couple of books by trans folks. I don't want to promote them, but they, they they came out this year in the UK and then and they got coverage and then your book came out and it, the in the pages of the reviews there was a kind of debate I didn't and and there was a way in which I was like oh that's an interesting literary culture it's an interesting literary culture where these kind of things actually do get debated in the in the like flat out and um, I kind of I got like a little bit of respect for it once I had some distance, distance from it. Um, but also I think that that I'm able to say that partially because I have a, a buffer of an ocean between myself and that debate. Yeah. I, don't know, I mean, like, what do you think? What do I think? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Cause I haven't, I, I can only, yeah, I kind of get more of a sense maybe of, of what American counterparts, how, like you say about the influence thing, about how it manifests there. It is pressing to live under here because it's just such a consensus and it's obviously very isolating to um, be the sole person that has made that kind of, um, I mean, obviously, like, yeah, I mean, weirdly today, I was actually ranting about how, in a bizarre way, the right-wing press here has afforded me more respect in some ways. And the left wing press because all of the like the time um yeah like uh, like there's a magazine a satirical magazine called private eye which is quite wearing they all got their like reviews out really quickly and it's like the guardian has been really slow and like oh. i actually feel like the right here kind of like engaged with it and what's been interesting is i i, I haven't read reviews really but my friends file them for me but um because my text is very socialist and it's like prison abolitionist and things like that and critical police, <laughs> I, I managed to have somehow managed to convince the right wing to just be really angry about the fact that I'm a socialist more than the fact that I'm a trans woman, which I'm t- <laughs> which I'm yeah. taking as like a win because I think yeah. um, because because I refuse the the culture war stuff that we're having in the UK, which is all about like and my book doesn't mention the Olympics or sports because. Right. I don't consider it a major issue because actually very few trans women are going to be elite level sports. Like I'm interested in the fact that most trans women are adjacent to or have done or are doing sex work. So there's like a whole chapter on yeah. sex work and no more sports. And I think that's completely thrown a lot of reviewers. Um, so yeah. I feel like I'm a kind of cat amongst the pigeons. And I, I actually think D-Transition Baby did that too. I mean, like it was reviewed by some people that like they're nonfiction when they're not reviewing books, they're quite by vocally gender critical, for example, but they seem to at least sensibly like the book, partly because I think they felt that like 
the fact the characters had sex and were like, you know, um, they talk about like erotic cross dressing kind of confirmed maybe some of their prejudices. But um, but like in some ways yeah. it was interesting for me that yeah, that there were people who who engaged with the transition baby um that were perhaps unexpected, um, having known their names and they yeah. read their Bible for many years. Um, and it, and it, I don't know. Yeah, it shows me. I guess when you ask what I think, I think it shows that the book as a form allows things, whether it's nonfiction or fiction, allows things that like the comment piece war that's happening in the UK of like column versus column, or like article versus article, or like TV or radio debate. Is the book kind of set like the book as a form circumvents that because it allows you to present arguments or yeah. ideas, concepts, and fiction that like aren't given space outside that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I like that. And I, I've been interested even in the ways that like, you know, I, I like the way that your book has been accorded respect. I like the way that you sort of chose the battles that it's gonna, that it's fighting rather than yeah. fighting the cultural war battles, you know? Um, so, and I, and I think that that's, that's also, you know, kind of responds also to that earlier question that you asked me about how do you, how do you, how do you not get chilled by, you know, in your writing by Twitter and stuff? So, well, you pick your own battles, you know, like I'm not, I'll never write a great book about trans women in sports. Like it's not my battle. I don't like, it just be a bunch of like hemming and hawing or whatever. Like it wouldn't be any good. Um, but you know, you can you can pick those battles and then people respond to you on terms. Um, and I and I think that the urgency the urgency of those battles come through um when you're picking them. So and I think that's true for, for fiction and so yeah, one question I wanted to ask you um is what had surprised you the most um about the reception to the book or doing the publicity to the book, something that you hadn't had uh expected or yeah really sort of like biggest surprise along the way in the kind of months since it was published um well it's been there have been a series of surprises um i my audience expanded a lot and so i, I had to sort of learn to speak to different audiences um i most of my writing in Earlier on, happened in Brooklyn. There's a sort of trans writing scene in Brooklyn uh, that's been going on about a decade, and I was largely speaking to other trans people. And my voice, when I write, is pitched at that audience. I've been, uh, you know, so that means that I don't explain words, you know, that are trans specific words. And I, I learned that from other minority writers who were basically like, "We don't slow down for." You know, like uh, James Baldwin or Tony uh, Tony Morrison, who didn't slow down for white readers, and they assumed that white readers could keep up. And by the same thing, it meant that they weren't. Uh, they had a hundred percent story and some sort of seventy percent story, thirty percent explanation. They didn't hinder themselves that way. And so I did that. That's always been my method. And what I was surprised by was was who. And I wanted people to read by analogy, not that I'm a trans woman or whatever, but, um, you know, I can see myself in this analogy. I can read across difference. Um, and we're very much like, I feel like right now there's a kind of mode of writing, which is sort of stay in your lane, uh, don't comment outside of your own experience kind of thing. And uh, I felt that people were really willing actually to read across difference. and so. I would find these readers that I didn't expect. Like, I, there were a lot of men, for instance, who read this book and, uh, you know, described sort of, they didn't have the words like gender performance, right? Like, like I'd meet these kind of guys and they weren't walking around being like, this is gender performance that I'm doing. And that's why I'm wearing flannel. It's, it's masculine gender performance. But they were, uh, you know, uh, or they weren't like this. I'm doing a gender, but they they understood. They read it and they were like, "Oh, this is describing something I do." And so I, you know, so I had this whole project that I have, which was really a project to talk about the place of the trans literature. 
and they're important to other people. Who like there was this uh, Dominican guy I met, and there had really very few queer friends, and someone happened to give him the book, and uh, and he, he didn't recognize a lot of the women's experience, but he recognized a lot of the gendered experience, um, and he ended up buying it for like a bunch of his a bunch of his guy friends, and they I don't think they had like any sort of idea of like the cultural meanings of this book, but I I've always been amused by like a bunch of like kind of tough Dominican guys like on the train all reading Detransition Baby. <laughs> like it's really, it's actually kind of cute. Um, and and I think that that's been, that's been both a surprise and a pleasure in this has been the way that I've had to argue with people who I thought would really get it and the ways that people who I didn't think would get it um, have been very open and friendly, especially as that like, sort of goes against a lot of you know, the ideas of, of who is who is an ally to trans women or who's friends of trans women who's so very been very yeah. so maybe you felt a something wrong. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean like I've been surprised. I've been surprised sometimes about who um who has responded in certain ways, yeah, and what they've responded to. The things that I thought would be the most inflammatory thing often haven't been, and then people are much uh, have a much stronger reaction for positively negative things. So, like as I kind of mentioned earlier, like people seem much more uh, annoyed about um, you. I'm just checking; you can still hear me, okay? Not yeah, you're right. just fine. Just fine. Okay. Cool. Um. Yeah. Like as I say, like people are much more. People seem to really, really annoyed, for example, that I um, am not a particular fan of, like, trans people in the military, like, like as a goal, as a political goal. I don't mean the individual. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, that kind of, like, well, well, you forget, like, when you go to another mainstream audience, like, you forget that when you're on Twitter or you're in queer political kind of circles all the time, things like pinkwashing and things like that and leftist circles are kind of, like, people are talking about that all the time. And then... It goes to a kind of more mass audience, and people are like, "What do you mean you don't want trans police officers? Surely that would help everything." <laughs> <laughs> and that's like the people who are like well disposed, and they get really angry with me for saying that. And like, there can be like people who were, uh, yeah, like, like I've had a couple of like quite prominent broadcasters here who are like middle aged cis straight men who have basically been like this completely changed my opinion. I thought it was like. And and it and it, what's interesting is that I guess that they've just been guided along, not ever really actually doing any critical thinking about trans politics. Uh, and this is their first foray into it. And then they they've kind of been like tabula rasa, and they've kind of been won over by just hearing yeah. like like because I do a lot of like um, reporting and and uh, like amplify the voices of other people at interview work, basically uh, in the book. And so obviously they're hearing like other trans people not so much me in their own words and um and yeah so they'll have this light bulb moment and actually they're easier than the people that were like half allied anyway but don't really agree with my political perspective so it's a different it's a different form that it takes to you but it, like yeah it's it's an interesting one so like i mean surprised. i think what's interesting here also too is that both you and i have like highly idiosyncratic and individual sort of like viewpoints on how things work which I think with trans issues, you know, a lot of people are used to a sort of like a monolithic position, right? Like this is the trans position on this issue. And, you know, for fiction, that that sort of monolithic uh, opinion, like where you're speaking for people is just it's a kiss of death. It's just a immediate, horrible, boring book. Um, and... I do think that actually when people realize like, oh, the, like this is why I want a lot of other trans writers to write with me because when you get a kind of cacophony of voices and you realize that trans people don't agree on a number of this stuff, then it forces people to actually be like, well, which, not only do I agree with trans people or disagree with trans people, but which trans people might I agree with? And like, how do they put these ideas and, and how do they feel about gender? Because you know, even ideas of like, what does it mean to be a woman or what does it mean to be trans or any of these things, like there's not, there's not consensus on that. And like, 
that's part of like, that's part of been like the fun for me of like detailing trans women's culture is that there's a, there's a political purpose, which is to like air those divisions. Another one is to just like show like detail that like, look, this is like an ongoing discussion, which you cis people really ought to like jump in on because if we're deciding what gender means, like it has ramifications for you. So, you know, like educate yourselves, get in on it and like do it. And that's, that's been, um, that is, that is, I think has been like also fun to talk about is to talk about, you know, trans divisions rather than, I think in this media climate where people expect you to sort of regurgitate, uh, yeah, an accepted point of view that there's a huge, there's a big opportunity for being, um, a trans individual, whether that be, and, you know, and I think there's space for many more trans individuals who, you know, frankly disagree with, me. like, it's, it's much more fun to, to, to have a series of sounding boards and to write into a bunch of sounding boards than to sort of have to create the conversation from scratch. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more there. I mean, what's been funny doing press tour for my own book and like, Doing the, the more mainstream I go, so like the yeah, the more mainstream and bigger the media is, the more I actually have to say this. But like I've literally done like a string of interviews over the last month, and I don't know how many times I've like basically made a like joke with the interviewer where I'm just like, well, of course everyone thinks that we're like one monolithic movement that's promoting gender ideology, and that we all agree. And obviously, like as as a trans person, it's just like inherently funny because it's like no no community I know of that like argues more viciously with each other <laughs> about right. the minutiae of gender and also yeah but like it's very odd as well to have that like encounter where like someone who has been sold this kind of myth of like one way like one trans ideology basically in my case that people will put things to you like well you believe gender is like your gender identity is like an innate soul and i'm always like no <laughs> I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't yeah. believe like gender identity is like a soul that sits within a person. Like I, I don't believe that. I believe like gender isn't really, not born with your gender identity, really. Um, and and you can tell that really throws people. So I quite enjoy that. But I think I have to kind of articulate it explicitly. Whereas I think as a fiction writer, hopefully it would be less didactic and more like mimetic. I guess is that you can show the diversity. Yeah. By presenting different characters who happen to be trans, which is probably I I yeah. do that. I think that's more of a luxurious way to do it than like having to spell it out. What's that? It's that it's that Tolstoy quote that I'm that I can't quote exactly, but that you know novels can do a can novels can make sense of problems that that uh, you know that an argument just can you can can't can't lay out for you. You can solve problems emotionally that just don't make sense in a sort of logical epistemology. And I've always, I've kind of always gravitated towards that, but um, it's really nice to also have people like you doing counterpoint and, you know, in your, in your, in your next book, uh, maybe competing and, and counteracting things that I say in, uh, in fiction too, because I, I, I really think that that's the most, that's, that is how the most robust books get read, like in conversation with each other. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you asked about when you actually, that made me think about like, yeah, it's, it's a strange thing, isn't it? Because like, I think when you were talking about the anti-trans books that have been published, the non-fiction ones in, in the UK, that like some of mine have been like reviewed again. Yeah, like in a weird way, now that I have the privilege of like a platform and getting a book that's also being reviewed alongside that, in some ways, I feel like, yeah, it's good that, like, like, I wouldn't try and get those books, like, not published. Like, I'm glad that they've published them. Right. Because that, there's a sort of, like, level of inclusion to that already. It presupposes a certain level of inclusion. Whereas, like, anxiety about cancel culture or people, I, I feel like often that's been a response to the fact that, like, trans people haven't had necessarily the equal opportunity to that platform, too. So something like trying to get things like the publishers drop books or like yeah. people in places to ignore the existence of books or like to like not have Jermaine Greer come and speak or whatever it is. It's a blunt instrument against a lack of um, a lack of trans platforming. Would you, whereas it sounds like what you're saying, 
and perhaps I now have some sympathy with, but we are in a position where we can say this app is that you are more interested in actually elevating trans writing than you are in particularly in like pressing or counteracting or fighting anti-trans writing or hostile yeah. writing. And even in my own writing, like the villains are very rarely cis people, right? Like it's and and it's not like my books are my stories are almost never trans people versus cis people. It's usually trans people who disagree with each other. Like, and I'm much more interested in the fights within a community with people who seem would seem to agree than I am with like saying that these people, you know, these the other is bad. I mean, and I think again that's something that I've been guided guided by other you know uh, minority writers before me. If you look at like the bluest eye, well, the context for the story in the bluest eye is you know anti-black racism in the United States, but the actual way that that plays out is in uh, a girl's, you know, self-image and the ways that her her own family mistreats her. And I think that, um, you know, for me, the, the, the really fertile ground, and I, you know, I'm waiting for there are other writers to come who will come around and prove me wrong, but the really fertile ground uh, is actually between trans people and the ways that we disagree with each other using kind of transphobia or the condition of trans people as like a bigger context rather than actually making the obstacle to getting everything cis people, which I don't know, it just doesn't interest me or it seems a little bit flat. This leads me on, well, actually my next question, which I was going to ask you, um, yeah, and again, without being too sort of like self congratulatory, um, I think is something that I'm adjusting to. So I'd be interested to know is that I think when, uh, yeah, as you did, you wrote a book that, yeah, then got kind of like a mainstream presence um, amongst cis people, amongst mass culture, outside of trans, uh, and trans feminine subcultures, for example. Is that because, like, it's also, it's not just our, like, writing community or our writing peers, it's also, like, our friends, social scene, is that, like, because the trans community and the trans women's community and then the trans women who write communities you know, on both sides of the Atlantic are um, all, you must have experienced quite a huge upshot and not just like fame in terms of the wider culture, but like particularly within the trans community through the, your name recognition and the level of fame that you're perceived to possess by other trans people. Um, and I'm wondering how you felt about that um, and whether or not that's been challenging in any way. It has been. Um, you know, it's, it's, and it's, but I also, again, relate to it. Like I, there was a previous generation for me where it was like, I looked at that previous generation and I was like, if only I had what they had, you know, and now that I'm here, now that I'm here, I'm sort of like, oh, they had like, I had pictured them as like lunching on lobsters in the mansion. And it was like, oh no, they were like eating Cheetos in the shack, you know, like, and so now there's people like banging on the door of the shack and they're like, let me in. And you're like. I guess, like, you know, and, and so there's a way in which, um, you know, the, and that's not true, totally true, like, I'm getting more and more opportunities, but it's, it's sort of hard, the biggest problem is to sort of place yourself and have, like, perspective on yourself when there's a bunch of people who are like, you're the establishment, all of a sudden, and then meanwhile, like, I'm looking at the literary establishment, I'm like, I'm pretty sure that I'm not the establishment, but to those girls i am the establishment like i'm the one who if i did this or that they feel i could like make or break their career and that's a that's kind of like a that messes with your mind because it's there's such the 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 differences of scale between being trans famous and being you know author famous and being like i don't know actor famous you know, it's yeah. like, it's like the difference between like a million and a billion, you know? So, uh, and, and a lot of this year has been like, just trying to maintain perspective on like what this actual change in my life means versus what it means to be, you know, I'm not, I've met actors this year and, and, and their lives are legitimately completely different than mine, you know, like, like what they what they can do and how they live is not 
is not comparable to a famous trans author, like trans famous and trans author, which is different than <laughs> famous famous trans author, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, I think, yeah, the trouble is, is there's that sense of perception isn't there. It's the same thing as like people who are big on social media platforms like Instagram or Twitter, but maybe not so famous with real to world terms of that. Is that like if you have a community that like, exists a lot on social media then like the fact you have a blue check or whatever can mean that people like you have yeah. a famous part. and then i think like yeah i think there's a point where you probably ascended beyond that in this yeah within within trans circles because yeah just because of a level of rain, name recognition that you it, it's it, like your name and the name of the book will now yeah, has stepped outside of like purely trans content um and actually you've like again, let me read well to what might be my final question because we're keeping on time. It is actually because you, 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 by talking about generation actors, you wrote an essay this year about Hunter Schaefer. Is that how you pronounce yeah. it? Schaefer. Schaefer, yeah. Yeah, I understand. Jerry, uh, uh, yeah, and I end up mentioning her a lot in my interviews too, weirdly, because I watched Euphoria um, in like April on a day where I was ill. I like binge watched it. And um, I'd never seen it really. And I, it was obviously quite mind blowing. Like I was watching it with two cisgender friends, and um, at my age, like early thirties, they hadn't realised the character Jules was trans, and I didn't realise they didn't know that. And I like, seen her inject oestrogen on on screen, but like she hadn't alluded to it. And then there was something that came up, and they were like, "I don't understand it." And I was like, "She's trans. <laughs> She's trans. The actress is trans." And they were like, "Really?" <laughs> I was like, "Yeah." Um. And I brought it up a lot because, like, a lot of people with my book are asking about, am I hopeful? You know, are you hopeful about, even though we're in an anti-trans backlash or whatever? And I kind of say, like, there's different ways you can look at it. Like, institutionally in, in the UK, yeah, there have been some, like, real victories for trans folk in terms of our right-wing politics or, like, um, uh, yeah, making institutions afraid to be supportive of trans people. But culturally, I feel like trans people probably are winning the argument in terms of uh, art and film and TV and literature. I was like, actually, trans people seem to be slowly and in a non-linear way progressing in that. And I always mention, I always mention Euphoria and Hunter Schaefer as like an example of like a group like that. Like it would have been unthinkable to have had kind of a trans form of representation um, like that when I was younger. And where I'm going with this is whether or not not you think like novels, that kind of form, is the form that you will, you probably always write novels, right? But are you interested in other forms? Are you interested in like theatre, television, film? I know that there are like probably people who have been interested in adapting the novel for television. Is that something that you're interested in, like in expanding the conversation through yeah. form as well as different stories? I mean, I think that this is, it's mostly that, like, I have a series of arguments or a series of, like, artistic suppositions, and I'm interested in to see, like, putting them in different contexts and basically being like, well, I feel like my artistic supposition was correct in prose, which is, like, really my, my home. What is this artistic suppos supposition, which is, like, here's how to depict trans people, here's how to put them in conversation with the culture. Is this, is this portable? Is this, does this work in other mediums? So, you know, the first thing I, I, um, that happened is I, you know, I, I am, I got an option on the novel and then they were like, do you want to write it? And I, it was a little more complicated than that, but in the end I did. And then eventually I became an executive producer on, on making the novel into a show for Amazon, which, you know, it's not necessarily greenlit yet, but I'm in the process of working with Amazon on it. And then, People, you know, people did like sort of my approach. And so now I'm writing a rom-com. Uh, and part of the idea of the rom-com is simply that it's, uh, you know, a lot of rom-coms with trans women before, the obstacle to her finding love is that she's trans. It's like, this guy likes her and she's pretty and nice and cool, but she's trans, you know, and that's, that's positive as the obstacle. And so I'm like, well, what happens when you write a rom-com with a trans woman where the obstacle isn't necessarily that she's trans? Like, what if, the, what if her being trans is equivalent to, like, 
in Harry Met Sally, where Sally is annoying, like Sally orders food annoyingly at restaurants, right? It's like a personality quirk rather than a, like a, a plot point. And I basically think that this is actually how a lot of trans women experience their transness is not as like, it's, it's a, it's a personality quirk. It's something that, not a quirk, but it's a trait. It's something that is, informs your life, but is not the major obstacle to your life. And that is why I think a lot of us have rich and full lives. Um, and so, but I don't see that necessarily depicted on the screen or in, in very common genres. So my, my project, I think, is to, to sort of take these ideas about trans art and trans narratives that I've developed in prose and see if they are applicable in other mediums. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe everyone's like, that's not, we don't enjoy your screenwriting, Tori. And I'll go back to writing books and that'll be fine. But, um, but I'm, but I'm actively in the project of, of seeing whether or not that's actually the case. Okay. Um, well, that sounds exciting. Um, and yeah, I feel like, I feel like every, <laughs> surely there's better, I mean, craft space, there's better money in television. So I, I would definitely encourage yeah. you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we both know that like, we don't tend to get rich yeah. books apart from, apart from JK Rowling. Um, <laughs> Um, no, thank like thank you. I think that's like yeah, everything that I kind of wanted to ask you about. I just wanted yeah. to like thank you for um like joining me and having this conversation. It was really great to kind of like hear you yeah, like several months on because really I think we were just at the beginning of uh, yeah. having no sense of quite what the reaction would be to this. And I'm really pleased that it's yeah, I think it's been really positive and it sounds like it was positive for you overall and I think it has been positive. Um, in the UK and the US and hopefully in Ireland as well I'm sure that there are plenty of like trans women in Ireland who are bloody novelists as well so <laughs> um, hopefully some are watching um, yeah if I just want to say to anyone who's watched thank you for watching and definitely if you haven't read Deep Transition Baby then um, please do um, it's out so it's just out in paperback like it's out in paperback now in the US so it's going to be out in paperback I think very soon in the, in the, in the yeah. UK. Yeah, I yeah, imagine I, that they're going to want to be paperback for, for Christmas time. So Yeah, exactly. It's, so it'll be available in paperback for people who couldn't quite afford it. Hardbacks are expensive. I yeah. just said that as someone who's yeah, talking out. They're, they're ridiculous. ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I hope, so yeah, I'm definitely picking up the paper I'm out and uh, for everyone who's watched this conversation with me and is. And I hope enjoy the rest of the night so, thank you Tori. well before i go i just want to plug also sean's book uh the transgender <laughs> issue it's i just looked at uh pages of hackney's uh board and on um, instagram while saying number one uh number one bestseller in like all of the cool bookstores i'm sure it's uh you find it all over ireland in uh, all of like, the independent bookstores and uh Honestly, like it's it's a book that has that I've been waiting for someone to write for years, and uh, it was it was written better than I could have ever hoped for. Thank you for doing that, um, and I, I can't wait to be competing with you in fiction next. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, you'll, you'll definitely be. <laughs> um, we'll we'll okay, see. well, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Bye. Bye.